When we talk about comparative advantage and gains from trade, we often look at whether the price of a trade is mutually beneficial. But it's important to note that the size of a trade also determines whether the trade makes all parties better off. Let's do an example to see why this is. So here we have some productivity numbers in terms of output per hour. And we have a very simple setup. We have two parties, the US and Canada, and two goods, just the typical economic examples of guns G or butter B. And we can see per hour per worker, the US can make either two guns or seven butter, and Canada can make two guns or five butter. It's important to remember that in these productivity numbers, you have an or situation. For example, the US worker can't make two guns and seven butter. We could instead write this in terms of overall output for the countries by making, you know, let's say a very simple assumption that each country has 10 worker hours of labor, in which case we could just multiply by 10 by adding a zero to each of these, super easy. And then rather than calling this output per hour, we could just call it output. Here we have the opportunity costs for each of the parties, for each of the goods. And I didn't go through the calculations because it's not really the point of this particular exercise. But we can see here that the U.S. has the comparative advantage in producing butter because its opportunity cost of butter is two-sevenths guns, which is less than two-fifths guns. I'll just circle that here to remind us. And conversely, Canada has the comparative advantage in guns because its opportunity cost of producing guns is lower. Five over two is two and a half, which is less than seven over two, which is three and a half. So again, I'll just circle that so we can remember that here. We know that we get the potential for gains from trade when the parties involved in trade specialize according to their comparative advantage. So in this case, specialization would entail the U.S. only making butter and Canada only making guns. So we can think about what the world would look like if we were to engage in pure specialization. If the U.S. spends all of its time making butter, it can make 70, I suppose, sticks of butter, but then no guns. So we'd have an output that looks like this. As we can see, that's just coming from the top left output chart here. We can also see that according to comparative advantage, Canada is going to produce only guns. And if they do that, they're going to be making 20 guns and no butter. So now let's consider whether a trade will actually make both parties better off. And to do that, we have to have a before trade, after trade sort of comparison. So we need to define a no trade consumption status quo, if you will. So here on the top left, we see that this is sort of arbitrary. We've just assumed that in the absence of trade, each party is going to spend half of its time making guns, half of its time making butter. And if that's the case, then the U.S. will be able to produce and consume 10 guns and 35 butter. Canada will be able to produce and consume 10 guns and 25 butter. Again, I could have made this any allocation of time. Half and half is usually the easy thing to do. And the only thing that changes if I were to choose a differing existing allocation of time is that it would just change which trades make both parties better off. Now let's take a look at a trade. Let's say that the trade is five guns for 15 butter. And we usually think about the price of a trade by scaling this down so that we see we're trading one of something for a different number of the other thing. So I could say here that if I were to scale this down by a factor of five, the price of a gun would be three butter, or put the other way, the price of butter would be one third of a gun. 
And we can see based on that that the price is actually right. We say that a trade can make both parties better off if the price of the trade is between the opportunity costs of the parties involved in the trade. And in this case, if we were to think, for example, of the price of a gun being three butter, if you recall the opportunity costs of producing a gun for the U.S. was 3.5 and for Canada was 2.5, and three is in fact between those two numbers. So, so far in terms of the price, this trade is looking good. But look what happens when we actually implement the trade. So if we're trading five guns for 15 butter, we can obviously, we can look at the specialization numbers and we can figure out who's getting the guns and who's getting the butter. Because if you're not making any guns, you can't be the one giving up the guns and vice versa, right? So for the U.S., they're going to start with zero guns and they're going to be receiving some number of guns. Canada is going to be the one exporting the guns, so they're going to start with 20 guns and they're going to give up some number of guns. The U.S. is going to be exporting the butter, so they're going to start with 70 butter and be giving up some butter. Canada is not making any butter, so they are going to be on the receiving end of the butter, starting with zero and adding some. And it's important to remember here that when we're trading, you not only have to add the number to the party receiving the item, but you have to subtract it from the party exporting or giving up the item. So in this case, the U.S. would be on the receiving end of the five guns, so we'd put a plus five here. Canada would be giving up the five guns, so we put a minus five here. Canada would be on the receiving end of the butter, so they'd be getting 15 butter, put a plus 15 here. The U.S. is on the giving side of the butter, so we subtract 15 here. And our resulting numbers are then 5, 55, 15, and 15. And these numbers illustrate the point that I wanted to make that being that even though the price of the trade was correct and it could make both parties better off, the size of the trade actually wasn't proper to actually make both parties better off compared to what they were consuming before trade. And we can see that by looking at the no trade consumption numbers. The U.S. used to be consuming 10 guns and 35 butter. Now they're consuming five guns, so fewer guns, 55 butter, more butter, to determine whether they're specifically better off, we would need more information regarding how much they like guns versus butter, and we don't have that. So you can think of the price of the trade being a necessary condition for both parties to be better off, but it's not totally sufficient so that we also have to have the trade being a proper size so that both parties have at least as much of both goods as they were consuming before trade. I think it's also helpful to note that you could analyze directly whether a trade makes both parties better off by just implementing the trade as we did on the bottom chart here. And you can see directly whether trade makes both parties better off by just looking at what they have before and after trade without even explicitly calculating the price that the trade takes place at. In fact, I can show you a trade that has the same price, but is just of a different overall size that will in fact make both parties better off. So let's take a look at that. So here, rather than having the trade as five guns for 15 butter, it's just twice as big, that we're now trading 10 guns for 30 butter. Notice that the price of the trade hasn't changed, that the price of a gun is still three butter, but let's look at how the impact is actually different. And we can do the same exact thing, just implement the trade. And we say the US, because they're not making any guns, they're going to be on the receiving end of the guns. So we add 10 guns here. 
Canada is exporting the guns, so we subtract 10 guns here. Because Canada is not making any butter, they're on the receiving end of the butter, so we put plus 30 butter here. And then, of course, the U.S. is the one exporting the butter, so we subtract 30 here. And now our final numbers are 0 plus 10 is 10, 20 minus 10 is 10, 70 minus 30 is 40, and 0 plus 30 is 30. And now if we compare these numbers to the no trade consumption numbers, we actually can conclude that both parties are better off. Because like before, both countries have consumption of 10 guns. So they're not giving up anything in terms of guns. But now both countries have more butter than they had before. And so that presents a very clear situation. If you have more of one thing and you have the same amount of the other thing as before, you can conclude that you're better off without having to know how much you value guns versus butter. You could even take this one step further and think about what sizes of trades would conceivably work, and you could notice that because the U.S. and Canada were each consuming 10 guns before the trade, the trade has to be large enough so that they're both consuming 10 guns after the trade as well. So that's sort of the helpful rule of thumb that you can think about to consider whether a trade is large enough or small enough to actually make both parties better off.